In his first day on the job as Secretary of State, Antony Blinken pledged to repair relations with global allies and restore America's image following the attack on the U.S. Capitol. The world is watching us intently right now. They want to know if we can heal our nation. They want to see whether we will lead with the power of our example, if we'll put a premium on diplomacy with our allies and partners to meet the great challenges of our time, like the pandemic, climate change, the economic crisis, threats to democracies, fights for racial justice, and the danger to our security and global stability posed by our rivals and adversaries. After his comments at the State Department, Blinken was officially sworn in by Vice President Kamala Harris. He was confirmed by the Senate Tuesday in a vote of 78 to 22. Blinken previously served as an advisor and deputy secretary of state under the Obama administration. For more, let's bring in CBS News senior foreign affairs correspondent Margaret Brennan. She's, of course, also the moderator of Face the Nation. Hi there, Margaret. Great to have you. So Secretary Blinken gave his first press briefing this afternoon. Former President Trump's former uh, foreign policy, rather, was America first. Based on what you heard today, what can we expect from the Biden administration? Well, it is hard to find someone, uh, a cabinet secretary at least, who is closer to Joe Biden than Antony Blinken, the secretary of state. They are very much uh, of like minds when it comes to foreign policy. And the message has been America is back uh, in terms of trying to lead the global community. I think the bigger question is whether the world wants to be led by America and whether the American people are interested in, in taking on that role again. For Blinken and Biden, as they describe it, it's going back to traditional alliances like reasserting support for NATO, uh, for the European partners, and trying to reassure uh, them that the U.S. won't go it alone, but try to move in tandem with our allies, both to put pressure on adversaries, but also to strengthen some of those um, traditional allies. But, you know, the world has changed in the past four years. It's a complicated playbook. And you did hear Secretary Blinken from the podium say on a number of issues, well, we think we support this, but we have to look further into it. And an example was they are going to keep the Trump administration's Abraham Accords, that uh, series of agreements where Israel made peace with some of their neighbors in a formal diplomatic sense. But he said, we have to look at what promises were made for Israel to do that, or those countries to do that with Israel. It, it, revealing there that they're not fully uh, read in yet on maybe some of the private uh, agreements made by the Trump administration. He also agreed to keep on um, the Trump administration's envoy to uh, Afghanistan, uh, who is helping to negotiate uh, what is supposed to be uh, an end to the conflict and eventual withdrawal of U.S. forces. Margaret, we know that Russian President Vladimir Putin was the first foreign adversary that President Biden spoke with in these first days. What's the significance of that and what do we know about the conversation? Well, there are two ways to look at it, the significance domestically and that internationally. Domestically, uh, this was about signaling this is a very different approach to our adversary, Russia, than the Trump administration. That is, the White House made clear that among the things that Joe Biden, now president, brought up with Vladimir Putin was uh, the fact that they interfered in U.S. elections consistently over the past few years in 2016, in 2018, and attempted again in 2020. Um, also raising the issue recently of how Vladimir Putin has uh, gone after political opponents like Alexei Navalny, even using or having his intelligence services use banned chemical weapons to try to poison the man. Uh, because he posed a political risk to him. So this was a, a statement that they will stand up and at least pay lip service to the problem. The question is, what do you do next? Uh, and we haven't heard yet from the Biden administration policy-wise what their plan and approach is to uh, really punish Russia. Uh, the Trump administration, even though President Trump would often say things favorable about Russia, his other national security advisors would do things that were tough. So at least for the Biden administration, they're saying we're going to have both things, both the, the lip service and the action uh, be in alignment here. Internationally, 
it was very much a return to the classics that, you know, the first phone call was made to NATO before calling Vladimir Putin. The signal there, my alliance is with the military forces that were set up in opposition to the old Soviet Union uh, before I call the successor to the Soviet Union, Russia's President Vladimir Putin. So um, I, there weren't a lot of surprises there, but for the domestic political audience, this was, a, this was resonant. Right. Very clear intentions with the choreography of those calls, as you note. Very um, much so. Margaret, you mentioned, you mentioned Israel a moment ago. So the Biden administration also announced it is restoring relations with the Palestinian Authority. What exactly is that going to look like and how might it affect the relationship between the U.S. and Israel? Well, right off the bat, we know, based on the remarks made yesterday at the United Nations, that the U.S. will restore uh, some of the financial aid it provides to the Palestinian people, um, particularly those who uh, are refugees and living in camps, other kinds of things to help with education and other social welfare policies for those who are displaced but living within uh, Palestinian territories uh, and the Palestinian Authority. Um, the Palestinian Authority, if you remember, has control over the West Bank. Gaza, that other Palestinian territory, um, has been really the more controversial of the two because of the strength of Hamas in that area. Um, so for the United States to at least restore support, it's saying we aren't against the Palestinian people. We may have problems with your government, the Palestinian Authority, uh, and that we will take those up. Um, and there are a lot of problems with the Palestinian Authority and their leadership right now. So that's kind of a story that is only um, beginning to be told in terms of how the Biden administration will seek to put pressure on them. But it is also a clear signal to Israel uh, that the United States will no longer be so accommodating to Benjamin Netanyahu, who increasingly has been more and more aligned with the um, to the more conservative uh, right leaning portions of his own of his own constituents who are very pro settlements, meaning building Jewish settlements on Palestinian land and annexing territories, doing things that go against what has been traditional U.S. policy of maintaining international law. So again, this is a return to the classics for the Biden administration saying we are going to support a two-state solution, meaning that Palestinian Authority, the United States, is still saying they hope becomes a state someday, or at least some territory where Palestinians can live will have uh, the status of becoming a country uh, itself and independent of Israel. So that is meant to say to Benjamin Netanyahu, the idea that you are going to annex this ended with the Trump administration. Hmm. Uh, well, let's turn to the pandemic response. On Tuesday, President Biden committed to purchasing 200 million more doses of the vaccine. The Biden administration held its first coronavirus briefing today. What are the big differences you see so far, Margaret, between the Trump and Biden administrations on this? Well, I think we've yet to hear a lot of the details. We're starting to get more of them. We got those today uh, in part for the Biden administration, but some of it's going to be learned as they go. Um, I think at least symbolically and messaging wise, that is a difference between night and day with the Biden administration. They're really, as they love to say, putting the scientists and science out front um, and trying to provide more information and transparency. But it isn't clear yet what major changes they will actually make to the architecture from the Trump administration. The man running logistics, General Perna, uh, from Operation Warp Speed is still the man running logistics today. They have swapped in some different scientific advisors. They are uh, saying we'll spend more money to buy more vaccine from the uh, vaccine producers uh, who were uh, enabled by the Trump administration to do this on a really quick turnaround. Uh, so we haven't yet seen the guts of this, but some of the things like what President Biden announced with reimbursing states use the National Guard that's new. And that is something that even, uh, you know, Republican governors like the Jim Justice of West Virginia have said is the right call because that's how he was able to get it out to his populace. 
And finally, Margaret, yesterday travel restrictions went into place that require all Americans to show a negative COVID test before entering the country. And the Biden administration has also put in place restrictions on those entering this country from South Africa. Will that impact the spread of mutations inside the U.S.? Well, those are meant to, to stop the spread or to contain it. But um, when I put this question to Dr. Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner uh, who's on Face the Nation, he said he believes uh, those strains are already here in large part, that it won't be completely possible to seal your borders um, and prevent the spread of the virus and these mutations. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe that we're 11 months in and only now Americans need to show proof of a negative test before re-entering the country. If you're two years old or up, you now have to do that, according to the CDC and the State Department. Um, and in fact, they're telling Americans, really don't travel right now because you need to be able to guarantee you can have adequate testing on both ends. But a test is only as good as the day and the moment you took it on. So it is not a sure thing. It's really hard to seal viruses within borders. We're going to talk on uh, Facing Forward, our podcast, to the CEO of Eli Lilly, which is one of the companies creating treatments for COVID. And he has already highlighted that they have detected the B1351 out of South Africa, that strain, their treatment uh, has some holes in it, so to speak. It is not as effective in containing it or treating it if you get infected. So there is a reason to be concerned about these new strains, not just because it's a, it's a more contagious or another way you could get infected, but once you get sick, it may be harder to find a treatment uh, that could prevent you from being hospitalized. So we're going to talk about that with the CEO of uh, Eli Lilly on Facing Forward. I'm really looking forward to that. It's so sobering to hear, but so important to have awareness of what exactly the science is telling us right now. All right, Margaret Brennan. Margaret, always so good to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. Watch Margaret on Face the Nation every Sunday. It airs at 1030 a.m. Eastern on CBS and at 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. right here on CBSN.